The time was late December 1772. The place was Old New England, a small country town 60 miles north of London. The 47-year-old pastor, a former slave ship captain by the name of John Newton, needed a song for his New Year's Day service. He needed a song that would inspire the working people of his congregation after their Sabbath rest as they went back to lives of toil and hardships. A song simple people could connect with, heartfelt words that would stir the soul. Reverend Newton had already chosen the scripture for his sermon from 1 Chronicles 17, where King David looks back on his life and asks God with wonder, Who am I that thou hast brought me here? And he said to his congregation on that Friday morning, 1st of January, 1773, the Lord gives us many blessings, but unless we are grateful for these, we lose much of the comfort from them. So he said, well, never mind, David, now, what about you and me? When you look back, where were you when the Lord found you? And for himself, he says, I was a wretch. The first word of the hymn, grace. No, not just grace, amazing grace. Yes, that sounded right. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. He loved to learn from his mother and he could um, recite passages of scripture and all of Isaac Watts' hymns. But when his mother died, his father was away at sea for a year when he came back, he married quite quickly to a young Italian lady and they went to live in Essex. They had a child and Newton really got pushed aside. As a crew member on several slave ships, he helped scour the African coast in search of human cargo. Even the young Newton was thrown into chains once and forced to work as a slave himself on a small island off the coast of Sierra Leone. Eventually released from his captivity after about a year, the great blasphemer, as he called himself, went to a life so depraved that even his rough shipmates found it shocking. What a wretched life I lived and was saved from, he thought. Yes, put that in, that saved a wretch like me. How far I was from God and the life he intended for me. I once was lost. From time to time, Newton would make some attempts to get back to the faith that his mother had brought him up in. He would have times of prayer, he would even have times of fasting, but it, it was like a yo-yo, really. He was up and down all the time. He had no companion to help him, and he certainly didn't seek out any. Finally, on March 21st, 1748, Newton experienced what he would call his great turning day. In the middle of the night, the 22-year-old was awakened by a violent storm. Cries from his crewmates on deck sounded the alarm. Their ship, the Greyhound, was about to sink. As Newton scrambled up the ladder to the deck, the man directly above him was hit by a wave, swept overboard, and never seen again. Finally making it to the wheel, the great blasphemer raised his voice not to curse God, but to pray. In words he had not used for many years, John Newton pleaded, Lord, have mercy on us. Hour after hour, sustained only by his call upon God's mercy, Newton attempted to steer the battered ship through the violent seas as down below, the crew sought desperately to stop the holes with bedding and strips of clothing. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. For 11 hours, as the storm raged, Newton remained at the ship's wheel, not knowing if he would live or die. Gradually, the winds lessened and the storm began to calm. Newton's desperate prayer for God's mercy had been answered. And grace, my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. For the rest of his life, Newton would mark each March 21st with a day of humiliation, prayer, and praise for his great deliverance from the sea and the life of sin he had been living. Newton's dramatic conversion set him on a long, winding path that would take him towards a new life, not in one great leap, but step by step. It was through this experience at sea and his prayer, crying for mercy, 
that Newton's life began to be completely transformed. It wasn't a sudden overnight change, although some things happened immediately. He stopped blaspheming, he didn't swear again, and he began to read the Bible. But looking back later in life on this experience, he said, surely if I had any light then, it was as the first faint streak of dawn. Captain Newton came home from the sea to stay in 1754. He was 29, and it would be 18 years before he wrote his most famous of hymns. During this time, he grew in faith and knowledge as he learned both Hebrew and Greek. He also became friends with prominent preachers of the day, among them George Whitfield and John Wesley. Church leaders in the area gradually heard about Newton's amazing story and invited him to speak. The idea that Newton might have a higher calling was planted. He decided to apply for formal ordination. With all the teaching that Newton was receiving from people like George Whitfield and John Wesley and his many Christian friends in the independent churches, he was rapidly growing as a Christian and he began to exercise pastoral gifts. He felt that he could do more in the Church of England, the established church, but he wasn't accepted. He applied and was turned down. Um, finally, Lord Dartmouth was able to get him in in a great rush and get the Bishop of Lincoln to ordain him and gave him the living of the church in Oney. His authentic narrative, the letters about his experience up until that point, were published. And what is very interesting coming back to this theme of slave trading is that this book was so popular it, was, it went through many editions and it was translated into French and German and Dutch. So it went round the world, but nobody ever questioned the slave trading issue because at that stage, nobody was questioning it anyway. Pastor John Newton dipped his quill again. How could he sum up his long journey? Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. How could he make it clear that this grace was not a one-time experience, but something that was with him every moment of every day? Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. In the years after writing Amazing Grace, Newton moved to a larger, more influential post as pastor in a church in London's financial district. 